It's been a, probably a couple of months ago that Pastor Steve asked me if I would be willing to preach today, and uh, I welcome the opportunity. I have over the years preached a f- few times in three different churches in three states now, so I don't know whether that's good, bad, or otherwise, but anyway, I have a something that uh, I preached on once before. I won't tell you how many years ago it was, but I think it still bears repeating because of the uh, n- nature of the message. Some 38 years ago, actually back in 1978, that's a while ago, Anyway, the pastor of our church asked us to pick a verse out of the scriptures that had some special meaning for us and make it the verse of the year for us. And then come back a year later and report on what it did or did not do for us. Since Philippians is and has been one of my favorite verse uh, chapter. Yeah. Books of the Bible, I chose Philippians one twenty seven as my verse. And I think it does re- bear repeating. It has a lot of information in it that may be difficult for us to really comprehend. But here it is, Philippians one twenty seven. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Uh, Worthy of the gospel. Uh, are you worthy of the gospel? Are you walking a life that is worthy of the gospel? How about this age that we live, live in? We see so much today that just is appalling. And I don't need to tell you folks what it is. There's a lot of it around us. And more and more, We are living in a pagan world more than probably that we ever have. And I'm afraid it's just going to get worse. But Paul gives us a a challenge to live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Uh, Tall order. I find it uh, very difficult. And there are many ways that we can live our life that is worthy of the gospel. We can live our life in many ways that is not worthy of the gospel. Um, How should a Christian live a worthy life? What do you do to be worthy of what Christ has done for us. Think about it. Are you are you doing those things that make your life worthy? Can you walk down the street and you see so and so and can you tell that they're a Christian or not just by looking at them? Probably not. Maybe the way they talk, maybe the way they act. I guess a better question would be, can people see you on the street, talk to you for five or ten minutes, and know whether you're a Christian? Are your actions and your speech the kind of things that mark you as a Christian? It's important that we get to that point where we are different than the pagan world around us. I've chosen three things that I think the scriptures tell us about how 
to live a worthy life. I think that Christians are called to be different, aren't we? We're the salt of the earth. And there are many ways that we can fulfill that. The first thing is that a Christian is different from the pagan world because of our beliefs. Do any of you listen or read the um, email that comes from Breakpoint, Charles Colson's uh, program? Oh, you ought to. There are many things that come up in that that are are really are really wonderful. You get it on the radio, and I'm not sure uh, whether it's on KJOL or not. She's she's shaking her head, yes. But anyway, I get it on email every day. I get breakpoint from the Charles Colden. Yeah, Colson Foundation. And he talks in there many times about our worldview. And our worldview as Christians need to be very different than the worldview of many of those folks around us. I think one of the things that makes it so different is that the pagans' worldview is that there is no God, or maybe there is a God, but so what? And they look at everything around them with the idea that we can prove just logically, scientifically, that it happened. And one thing they will always exclude from that is the possibility that there's an intelligent being. You've heard of this intelligent design. Uh, they don't believe in it. They, they don't allow for the possibility of God being involved. A miracle. Oh, no. Coincidence. Everything that they say is just a coincidence, we can look at it with our worldview and say, ah, God had a hand in that. It wasn't a coincidence because God is involved in our lives. So our beliefs are different than those around us. You don't have to read very much before you'll find folks that uh, just poo-hoo anything about God and his working in our world. And yet, it doesn't take much if you really want to see it, to see that God is involved in everything that goes on. After all, he created this world, and he has given us a handbook to how to take care of the world that he created. And that Bible is our guide for everything that we do. Remember, Paul talked to Timothy and said, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So our worldview is that the Bible is our guide for anything that we, we need to be involved in. Now, not only should a Christian be different from the pagan world because of our beliefs, but in some ways almost more important that we should be different because of our talk. Do Does your talk match what the scriptures say it should be? 
Before you came to Christ, you probably had a vocabulary that was very different than what it is now, or at least what it should be now. Some people uh, just had a vocabulary that, and no disrespect to the Navy, Eldon, but they talk about talking like a sailor. I don't think that we have people talking like a sailor because there's just as many Christians there as there are anywhere else. But you've heard people just, they open their mouth and out comes a spew of vulgarity and things that should not be voiced, which just shows what's actually in their heart. When a person becomes a Christian, God's Word tells us that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So our old vocabulary ought to out the window. We should not do those things and say those things that we used to. And yet, as we talk, people ought to hear Christian vocabulary. Now, I'm not sure what Christian vocabulary is, but we, Bev and I have a friend and have had for many, many years a dear Christian lady. And yet, when you read her letters, it is, to me, it, it, it just, something doesn't sound right. Because she will, in a letter, spread throughout the letter, there'll be such phrases as, praise the Lord. Oh, the Lord has blessed us so much. Isn't the Lord good the way he... And and it's just continuous. It isn't just a phrase now and then. And yet, I wonder if she is trying to convince herself or somebody else that reads the letter. We had a friend one time that... Uh, or became a friend. A man came to our house that we did not know. I don't remember now. This is a couple of years ago again. But he was talking about that he had been involved in a serious car accident. And as as he talked and explained what had happened, he did insert this phrase. He thanked uh, the Lord. Let's see, it was only by the Lord's grace that he had not been killed. And he thanked the Lord for that. And that was it. You know, he didn't go on and elaborate really on that. And I thought at the moment, I caught that, and I thought, this man is probably a Christian. Just by that simple phrase that he uttered. Well, it turned out that indeed... He was a very, very good Christian man and lived that kind of life. As far as the speaking, you know, there's a a chapter in Colossians that I find quite interesting. I've read it many times. I think it's got points that uh, we need to keep in mind. When Christ, who is your life, appeared then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all Anger, 
rage, malice, filthy language. Do not lie to each other, since you're, have, you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Don't you really love it when you're talking to somebody and you really, you may know them, you may not know them, but all of a sudden as they're speaking, they start interlacing their conversation with all sorts of <clears throat> swear words and so on. I don't know about you, but when I hear this, right or wrong, I get the impression these people don't know Christ. Otherwise, why would they do that? Habit, maybe? Or maybe a little bit of uh, peer pressure that they just sort of blend in with other folks and other folks use that language, so why don't they? And yet, there in Colossians it says, get rid of filthy language from your lips. I, I hope that uh, that kind of thing is not part of your life. Keep, keep that, that mouth from saying things that ought not to be said. Now, not only should a person be different from the pagan world by the beliefs and the way we talk, but they also need to be different by the way we act. Paul also, in the letter to the Corinthians, says, So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. No matter what you do, do all for the glory of God. Your words tell what comes from the heart. Your actions also are part of what is part of you. And the actions need to be in accordance with God's word. Paul also in Colossians says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Notice how Paul ties the words and deeds. Deeds are our actions, but we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. You've probably heard it said, your actions speak so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. Ever hear that? Probably. <laughs> Just give me another example. While I was back umpteen years ago working at what was then McDonnell Douglas, we were in the uh, proverbial cubicles, you know, those little guys that are just big enough for your desk and your chair and walls this high, you can't see anybody. Well, there was one fellow that came to me and noticed that often I was reading the Bible during lunch hour. That kind of was my habit. And uh, he made some comments about it, disappeared, came back a bit later, and uh, <clears throat> gave me a poem that he had written that had uh, some information about placing one's hand in the hand of Jesus. I thought, that, that is neat. That is neat. However, I got to know this guy and found that his actions certainly did not match what he had said in that poem. He, he committed several, what I would consider, very unethical actions 
in, around the office. And uh, actually, some of them were illegal, but we won't go into that. But, you know, it really had been, would have been better if he had just handed me the, the poem. And he gave it to a lot of other folks, too. But you see, I, I liked the poem, but his actions were not what they really should have been. His, uh, his deeds were anything but what would be glorifying to Christ. We need, really, as you've probably heard before, we need to practice what we preach. If we let people know in one way or another that we believe in Christ as our Savior, then be careful. Everything you say and everything you do will reflect that. People will look at that and look at your life in view of what you have said and indicated. And it would be very good if your actions followed and your speech followed what you're saying. The practice what you preach is certainly a good thing to keep in mind. But we've seen the three things that involve a life that, <clears throat> excuse me, is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Our beliefs, our manual for handling our lives and the earth given to us in the Bible, the way we speak and the, and the way we act, all of those, and I'm sure there are many other things that are involved, but that is what people see, and that is how we really need to be quite different from the pagan world around us. I hope that as, as we leave here today, that each one of you will remember what Paul has told us in several places here. Remember, we are the salt of the earth. I'm sure that a number of you have heard me quote a little poem. I wish I knew where it came from, but uh, memory slips me. That's what happens when you mm, get along in years. You are writing a gospel a chapter each day by the deeds you do and the words you say. Men read what you write, whether faithful or true, just what is the gospel according to you. How many of you heard that before? From me, maybe, or from somewhere else. But it is worth repeating that what is the gospel according to you? I think this is an area that probably is something that you haven't really thought much about. Maybe you've read Philippians recently and read Philippians 127. And remember what he says in that, that whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. In closing, there's another passage, Paul's passage. I've stuck to Paul this, uh, this morning. But in Ephesians chapter 3, sort of a, one of his benedictions, he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we, more than all we ask or imagine, 
according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. There are other places in Scripture, too, that refer to the being worthy of the gospel. These are just a couple of them that Paul has given us.